Well, Careblazers, welcome to another episode. We have an amazing Careblazer and Care Course member, Judy, and she's going to talk about how she went from trying to help her husband let go and release some of his control over the finances so that she could start taking over. I think there's probably so many of you out there who can relate to this. And so, Judy, if it's okay to get started, can you just introduce yourself, who you're caring for, how long you've been caregiving? My name is Judy Foley, and I live in Chester, Virginia, which is just south of Richmond. My person is my husband. It's been really difficult to see this brilliant mind. He could read a book from 20 years ago and I'd pick up the book and he'd tell me what I was reading on that page. (laughs) To down to now he can't read Mm -hmm. at all. So it's been really hard. This is going on my fourth year after diagnosis. We knew something was going on before that, just with the memory and funny things. And he would start really having trouble with words. He has aphasia and he's gotten to the point where it's very difficult to hold conversations. So between not being able to understand what he sees and numbers and letters and not talking. It's really hard here. It's getting worse, but I keep going into these care support groups and saying, you're still so lucky. You're not there yet. So that's good. And I think sometimes the slow thing gets you prepared for making these changes slowly. Well, I see the changes. Now, my hardest thing is to not try to reason with him and rationalize because he just doesn't work. He wasn't in an accident and completely made a paraplegic or something. You know, so I don't know which one would be worse. I can make small changes without being obvious, cutting up his food at night. He grew up on a potato farm Mm -hmm. in May, very poor, very big, lots of work, lots of farming. And now he doesn't know what a potato is. And he looks at it. What's that? I go, oh, well, it's a potato. (laughs) That's hard. Yeah, that's super hard. So I know that whenever we're talking about caring for somebody with dementia, especially for years, there's probably dozens of different areas that have been a super big challenge. Like you just mentioned one with the communication and just watching him decline. But the one we're going to focus on today, which I think is going to be helpful for so many people, is the idea of finances. Can you spend some time talking about the problem and challenge you were facing with finances, managing finances and your husband? Well, Brian was the one in charge of paying all the household bills. Some of those we set up on an automatic thing, but he liked to do that. That was his thing. On Sunday afternoon, he sat down, he got all the things out and he checked off this and that and the other. And then I noticed probably three years ago, he stopped balancing the checkbook and I kept wondering what was going on. And then he started writing checks to weird things. Like he was making political donations to people who somehow mailed us things, but weren't in our state. They had nothing to do with any of our political affiliations or anything. And so that worried me. And then he would forget bills or he wouldn't remember where he put them. He still likes to go out and get the bills out of the mailbox and bring them in. But finally, one day after sitting there and looking at a credit card statement for probably over an hour, and making absolutely no sense out of it. He gave it to me. So he realized he was having problems. Well, I had been talking with him about it and I lied. Well, I didn't really lie. This was based on truth, but I kind of really pushed it. We also have problems with our post office, our mailboxes. They're outsourcing their deliveries. So the deliveries didn't come necessarily on time. They didn't come at the same time during the day. If you mailed something that used to take three days to get there, sometimes it takes eight days to okay. get there now. So then we started getting finance charges on our credit card statements, which he absolutely doesn't pay, won't pay, say that's wrong. I mailed it in plenty of time. And I said, well, you can't argue with them if they got it late. So I kept saying, I do mine through the credit union. I set up vendors and I put it in. I do all my making and stuff electronically, which he doesn't like. But I said, I can put it in when the bill comes in. It might not be due for three weeks, but I put it in the day it comes in with a date closer to when it's due. So we're not giving up our money early. Don't worry about that. But it's getting there on time. And the bank will make good if it didn't get there on time. So I kept putting it off on, do you really trust the post office to do this? This is our money. We don't pay 18% finance or whatever. So he finally started letting me do that. Now, this is genius because instead of saying you are making mistakes or you're not doing it right, or you're not 
doing it in enough time. You didn't blame him. You kind right. of blamed the system that's outside of your control. Right. And you right. offered an alternative that could be helpful. And how long do you think it took for him to come around to this idea? Almost a year. That's another good, important point, because sometimes people will give up and think it's not possible. They'll think that, oh my gosh, he's a resistant to it, or he doesn't want to do it. And so they think they'll never come around. But for a year, you kind of were planting these seeds. Well, it scared me. I mean, yeah. this is our livelihood. We don't work anymore. So we don't have the option of going out and making more money. We're set on certain amounts that come in and we expect what goes out. And I was concerned that foolish things would be done. Money being given away to people. When it sounds like that was already kind of happening? Very little bit. That was scary to me. How did you manage, before we get to the point where you're able to kind of switch them over, how did you manage or monitor what he was doing, knowing that he was making mistakes or not sending things out in time. We can sign on each other's checking account. It's always been set up so that if something happens, I can sign checks on his account and he can on mine too. So I went up and I talked with the bank. I do have a medical power of attorney and a power of attorney. And so I went up to the bank with all of the stuff I had and said, I need to be put on his account so I can slide things back and forth. And he's very trusting of me. I mean, I handle all the finances with our money accounts out of state, you know, our investment accounts and everything thing because I have a degree in business. He was a branch manager and handled all the inventory and stuff. So he's a numbers person or was, but not down to that level. So I can talk stocks and bonds with people and he just says, go handle it. It was humiliating to him. He's brilliant. You know, I mean, he could remember part numbers from 50 years ago and was a go-to guy in the industry and handled the whole branch for many, many years. So that was very difficult for him to acknowledge. And actually one of our doctor's appointments right after he was tested. I'll never forget that day. It was like somebody was slapping him across the face. The more the doctor said, the smaller he got, the more body language was like this. And he could not believe that he had trouble with the money section. And he couldn't believe he was making all these mistakes. And the doctor said, how are you doing this at work? And he says, slower. I'm doing it slower. He was still working at that time. He worked until about two years ago, three years wow. ago. Okay. And they sent him home during COVID and told him they didn't want to take the chance of him being exposed to people coming in and out of the branch. And he just never went back after that. So that was like a year that he didn't have a choice of mm -hmm. doing something. But the doctor asked him, do your coworkers cover for you? And he said, probably. And so there are times he acknowledges what's going on. He just can't verbalize it now, especially. So it took a long time to get there. I stick a piece of paper under his face and say, here, Rick needs this up in Maryland, sign it. And he signs it. Okay. The bank needs this, sign it. And he signs it. The bank give you any trouble when you went to try to get on his accounts? We were already on each other's accounts. We just don't use it. If I had to, I could, which is one of the things when we had the conversation in our support group about social security mm -hmm. not accepting a power of attorney and the VA not accepting a power of attorney, that totally completely floored me. You mean for financial reasons? Right. And like if his social security check didn't go directly, direct deposit into his checking account, he can't sign his his name on things anymore. So then we would have a problem. So I've been in a better place than a lot of people because that happened. And now I've gone back to the doctors and gotten some written diagnoses things from the doctors. So those I can present to people. When you mentioned you were going to the bank and you presented them the power of attorney and you presented them with all these things, what were you doing that for? I wanted to make sure that they were aware of what was going on. And if anything funny happened or I had limits put on our accounts, not limits that we, I just alerts. Yes. If a large checking amount goes through, notify us and stuff like that. It's a credit union, you know, and we've been with them for 20 some, 30 some years. Yeah. So That's another really great idea is since your husband still had some ability to write checks and was still had his hands in the finances, letting the bank know, Hey, how do you like mitigate your risk? You let them know when a big check or something out of the ordinary would happen. Now they're alerting you. And they're not stopping it. They're just letting me know so I can immediately yeah. go in and electronically I keep an eye on what goes out of the account. I started out by saying, why don't you let me handle these checks electronically and you record them in your checkbook? Mm -hmm. I'll put all the information on the check and when we paid it and then you can put it in the checkbook. Well, no, he wasn't 
interested in that. And then he wasn't keeping the checkbook anyway. The bank says, I've got this, I'm good to go. So it took me three days to reconstruct three years of bank ledgers on his account. I just came into my studio here and sat and did them. So balanced all the checking things and straightened them out when they were <laughs> weird. So now you're managing all the finances. Yes. Okay. And I'm still out of two accounts. That's the next thing I have to get straight. It's just double work. So that's why I'm trying to get this paperwork straightened out so that I can perhaps get the Social Security office to send his checks into a different routing number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I procrastinate with this stuff. It's like, well, we're not there yet. I can handle this. So Mike used to tell me, don't wait until it's too late. Get it in place now. <laughs> From the support group? Well, yep. So do you have a financial power of attorney? Yes. Okay. And so you had that in the beginning. Okay. Probably eight years ago. So yeah, that's we another never... important piece that really helps with the bank being able to take information from you and help you yes, do things. Absolutely. And then our powers of attorney and our wills and everything are set up with alternate signature people and stuff. So we don't have to put him through the humiliation of taking him in and saying, declaring him unfit or whatever right. it is, you know, we can just move it over to that. That's good. Right. What would you say was the biggest success, like the biggest thing that got him to go from him wanting to do, like, it sounds like this was his Sunday routine or his yes. weekly routine to do this, the banking and to do the finances. What was the thing that got him to kind of hand it over eventually? The way we operate our household accounts is we charge everything all month long and then we pay the credit card bill mm -hmm. and that's it. So we just have an, you know, it's very simple bookkeeping. We own our house, so we don't have a mortgage and other things are set up on budget plans like electric and stuff like that. Well, he sat there for almost two hours staring at a credit card bill and picking it up and putting it down and picking it up and put and, and shuffling papers from one place to another. And I think he just got tired of doing it. He just couldn't make heads or tails of it. He didn't yeah. understand what they were saying on them. He didn't understand the debits and credits on the statement. It was just, I guess, his acceptance of where he yes. was. And would you say that his acceptance of where he is, like that pretty much, he's like that with all kinds of other different areas. So it's easier for you to give him help. Or are there some areas where he's like, no, I can still do this. I don't need your help. It takes him a long time and he gets internally frustrated. He doesn't take it out on me often. Okay. Once in okay. a while, he does. You know, I can do that. I can still do that and say, okay, go ahead. But when he takes the, the remote control and throws it across the room because he can't tell six from four and he can't find things or go in and instead of turning the channel, he turns it off and he's staring at a blank screen. And I said, what's wrong? Well, it just went away. So I turned it off. So of course it takes 10 minutes to get that statement out. But I think a lot of times when we talk about dementia, we talk about the person who seems to be in denial and the person who doesn't realize anything is wrong, but it's different with your husband. And this is a good point because some people with dementia do have an awareness that something is not right. Something is not working. And that can be incredibly frustrating and depressing for them. For two years before he was diagnosed, he would stand there and say, something is really wrong. I think I have dementia. I don't remember this. I don't remember that. Thinking of where he came from, and his IQ, that doesn't surprise me. He was very aware of right. what was going on, and he still is. Now, the thing that's scaring me the most is like, you know, he'll say, just take me in the woods and let me die. Mm -hmm. And I say, it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. So you're not going to change my mind about that. And the thing you did the other day about the involuntary facial tics mm -hmm. and so on. That's absolutely happening. And my sons used to come to me and say, mom, I don't think you're going to have a problem with him just going away gently into the sunset. He's going to be depressed. He might try something bad. Well, right after we got the diagnosis, I called my sons and said, come over here and get the right hunting rifles, yes. knives, all that stuff. Don't take them out of the house, get the bullets. We took all the bullets and everything, handgun that he had went. That now, did he know you did that? No. Okay. He still doesn't know. He hasn't been hunting in probably 40 years. And we have a little gun rack that's up in the top of his closet area. He's got three rifles in it. Those rifles are still there, but he hasn't held them. When we cleaned out his office, he had a handgun in his desk drawer. I don't know anything about guns, but evidently it was a very nice and expensive one. And he put it in a special case and we had it in boxes when we came home. Well, I took the box out of the car and hid it under the bed and then called my son and said, come get this thing out of that 
the house, which he did. Now it's the garden tools that bother me. He called one of my sons over probably four times because the lawnmower wasn't working. He couldn't start it. He mm -hmm. couldn't do it. And so trying to find things that he can do is getting more and more difficult. He have hobbies. He's a reader. He would read eight books a week before we went to the library every week. And he'd get out eight books and he'd read them. And now he's lucky if he can get through one. How does he spend most of his time now? Outside, in the garden, picking up sticks. Walks around. He has, you know, the little can grabbers. He has a bag in one hand or, or a can that's on wheels. And he goes around and he picks up the stick and puts it in the bag. Eight hours a day, he picks up the sticks. He's really active. Yeah, he is. He tries. It bothers him a lot when we have bad weather and he can't get out. But mm -hmm. what does he do during those days? Sleeps a lot. Takes a lot of naps follows me around the house from one room to the other, just, you know, a little shadow. What's he doing now that you're doing this with me? He's outside picking up sticks yeah. in the backyard. He hasn't wandered. He hasn't okay. gone anywhere. And he has been telling our neighbors that he has dementia. Because I went over probably four or five months ago, I started going to neighbors' houses and saying, I just want to let you know, you know, if something weird comes up, just, you know, point him in the right direction. And yeah. and so they knew and he, and they would say, oh, well, he told us that over the fence wow. the other day. So really, wow. okay. Interesting. Now you've done so many things that are really great in terms of preparation and planning. And I'm wondering how you knew to do those things, to alert the neighbors, to make sure the gun's weren't going to be able to, you know, get your, rid of it. Your Care Blazer group. Inside the, the Care Force. That's been the biggest source of information for me. I read incessantly myself. So I've read the 36 hour day. 36 hour day yes. I've read on Pluto. I've been reading everything I can get my hands on and other people's stories. Yes. And seeing what they're doing. Now, specifically in the Care Course, are you referring to the support groups and hearing other people? But, but the support groups have been phenomenal. The okay. Different things that people have tried, their stories, their successes, their concerns. And then in the care course, your shorts, your little things that you send out during the week are phenomenal. I mean, in the Monday emails? Yes. Those. Yeah. And then on Instagram, you know, yeah. you have mm -hmm. these things on Instagram. And then a couple of things early on, you had Tipa Snow on. You had a, what was she? She was an attorney, an elder. Yes. Elder attorney. Actually, she's coming in next month for our program. She's going to be doing some live Q and A's for everybody. So that's Good. Jane Allison Austin. She's an elder law attorney out of California. She's going to be doing some elder law live sessions with our group in the next couple of weeks. I'm excited for that, but that's right. She talked about the legal yeah. stuff as well. And you had a gentleman that you worked with, and I can't remember if it was nutrition that he was doing. You had two uh, easy chairs. He was really interesting. But he's a psychiatrist here in Arizona. Yeah. Okay. Those so, things were really helpful to me and made me start thinking about other things. No, and I love this. And the reason I'm asking is I'm trying to figure out caregivers everywhere are going to be facing similar situations, whether it's trying to keep somebody busy, trying to help somebody who realizes something is wrong, not being able to communicate, all these different things. And it's like, how did you get to a place where now you can support yourself and help yourself? And it sounds like the key thing that I'm taking away is that you are actually seeking information. You are actually taking an effort to learn the information. Now, I imagine some of the stuff is actually hard to implement or hard to do. Like it might be a bit of a challenge. <laughs> I am a type A personality and I have to be, I can face anything if I am prepared. If I know what's coming, I'm okay. I can figure it out. I can do something with it. Just gobsnapped with stuff. He woke up the other night from taking a little cat nap while we were watching some television program. And he said, why did you rearrange everything? Huh? And I was like, what? excuse me, what? And I didn't know what to say. And I said, I didn't, you know, and when I was talking to my friend the next day and said, the strangest thing happened, you know, and she said, well, you know what you should have said. And I said, what? And she should have said, well, I thought you'd like it this way. Mm -hmm. Do you want to change it back? <laughs> so I said, oh my God, I don't think that way. That stuff is really, really hard for me. I do find myself running through things. My son came over one day 
away and we were talking about something. The three of us were standing there and Brian said something. And I said, no, that's not the way it was. This is what happened. And, and he said, well, yes, it was. And I said, no, you're wrong. That wasn't the way it was. And my son pulls me aside when he was on his way out and he said, don't do that. And I said, don't do what? And he said, why are you arguing? Your words, why let it go? It's not worth the point. Yeah, but it's interesting. It's like, it's still kind of a reflex. Yes. Oh, absolutely. We always were extremely honest with each other and we would point out things that were wrong with the other person needed work or we needed to work on things. And that's just been our relationship for years. That's gone. Do you feel like you're becoming more aware or it's happening less often that you're getting trapped into correcting him or arguing with him? Or do you feel like this is still something that is it's just happening like it always has because it's just such a hard habit to break? It's not something that's always been there because there are things now that have to be corrected, safety thing. And I don't know how to approach those. If I see something that's unsafe, how do I not scream, don't do that you know, or whatever? Yeah. When it comes to correcting, if there's no danger or safety issue, there's no need to correct him. Right. He could be wrong all day long. You could say, oh, that's interesting. Or, oh, I thought you'd like it. Or, oh, you know what? I must have slipped my mind. It doesn't matter, right? But right. if safety is happening and there's an imminent safety concern, you do intervene and you do correct. Yeah, you right? have to. But if he's saying something like, you know, whatever he was saying when the three of you were standing around and you're like, well, it didn't happen that way. It's like, does it really matter? Right. Yeah. This was the end result. And we both agreed with what the end result was. So who cares how you get from A to C yeah. as long as you do it? You don't have to go through B. Right. It's better for him, but it's also better for you because you're not stuck in the back and forth. Yeah. But I get the burning in the pit of my stomach. It's not easy and it's not, I don't feel better. Now that would be better than I'm not arguing. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But, yeah. Now that would be something to bring up in one of the live Q and A's, right? Where we talked about like, how do we change our thinking to help mm -hmm. us feel better? And one of the biggest things I recall about you in one of the recent sessions, do you know where I'm going? Oh, I think so. But tell me what your tell me your perspective. Um, I have a real hard time saying untruths, mm -hmm. period. You know, lying or yeah, you know, little white lies and stuff like that. And I came up in a very rigid household that was this way, this way, this way, very, sure. very structured. I think a lot of us are coming from that place. Yeah. And so it's really hard for me to do that. It's really hard for me. And I feel like that's not a control issue. It's just lack of anything. Mm -hmm. It's really, really a hard thing for me to do. What we're talking about for the people listening is like overcoming difficult challenges, right? How do you really get success? Oh, it was the bathing. Bathing, toiletting, and dressing. Oh my. There like, you go. There yeah. You go. How are we? Like we did a whole series on that. And in the beginning of one class, you showed up and you were basically like, there's no way. I can't see this is going to work. Was it on the bathing issue? Yes. Yes, yep. it was. Yep. And then literally by the end of that class, at the end of the hour, you said, I'm starting to see the possibilities. One of the other attendees said something that turned the light bulb on in my head. And it was, she was giving her husband a foot bath or something like that. Yes. It never occurred to me that you could break the task of a shower down into sections and say, I could wash his hair. I could do that instead of get in the doggone shower now. You smell bad. You know? Right, right. And so that's the power of coming together as a group in that environment, but also the power of being open to the possibility. Because at the beginning of that class, it was hard to break through that we could have some success here. Right. There could be a way to help your husband bathe or shower. Absolutely. Because it's still absolutely disgusting to me. It turns me off right. and I just turn my head and walk away. And by doing Doing that, you continue to perpetuate the problem of him not taking a bath or shower, right. right? And so then going through this idea of like just being open. And again, I think this speaks so much, Judy, to how much you're open to learning, how much you're open to hearing other people's experiences and how much you show up and do to try to expose yourself to different ways of thinking. I think that's a lot because you were pretty stuck in that position in the beginning, but you allowed yourself, once that light bulb went out, you're like, oh, well, maybe, you know, it was like this, this huge shift. And so I think if there's another big, important thing that anybody can get from this video and chat with you is that it's okay if it feels impossible right now. It's okay if it feels like there's no way to make improvement. It's okay if you don't have the answer right now, but putting yourself in places and talking to people and just keeping your ears open to a possibility. It was literally in an instant with you where you're like, oh, I have hope now.
I think there might be a way from there is no way, there is no possibility to there is possibility. And that was a big shift. So I think that's pretty amazing on your part. Well, (laughs) a lot of work left to do. (laughs) Always. It never ends, right? No, it doesn't. So I know we kind of started out with the finances and it sounds like if I were to make the key points here, you had stuff done ahead of time. So for anybody watching, if it's possible still to consider getting a financial power of attorney, consider speaking to an elder law attorney. And for those of you in the care course, we'll have Jane Allison on periodically for her to answer some questions and help guide you to be sure you're on the bank accounts let the bank know what's going on. And then the most important thing I think that really stands out to me, which I think is just a beautiful way you handled it, is you didn't really make it about him having problems. He kind of was already aware of it, but it wasn't right. ready to give it up. But you kept the patience over a year and blaming the system and blaming the post office and blaming the, you didn't really make it about him, which would have, I think, hurt him more. You made it about that system. And then you stuck with it for a year. And while you were waiting for that year transition, you put safety nets in place. You spoke to the bank, you put on alerts. So you were doing things while still letting him come to that place. And I think that's wonderful if that's an option for anybody out there. Because I think a lot of people, and I imagine you would have had this too, you just want to force it and just say, give it to me, you're done. Exactly. I'm going to hide your checkbook. You know, I'm not going to order you any more checks. You don't know how to do that. So uh, we're good. How did you not do that? Because that's like where most people would go. It just sort of happened. It evolved. You know, when he decided that he couldn't read that statement, he stopped. It's but just, there was time like when he quit he smoking, there. he was smoking three packs a day and, and he went into a doctor to have some procedure done and the doc says, can you get rid of this? for a week. He put them up on top of the refrigerator and never had another cigarette. How do you do that? Hey, I can do that. But I'm wondering more about your patience until he came to that realization. Because there was like a year's period there where he was still trying to hang on. A lot of it is just denial. We're fortunate that we have backup amounts of money, you know, put in different places. And he does financial advisor up in Maryland. I told him three years ago, if Brian calls you, call me and let me know what's going on. And we've been dealing with him for 12 years, you know, my mom's account and everything. So he's very aware of our family. And so that was good. I I don't know if push came to shove and it became a legal thing, but Brian never felt comfortable dealing in that world anyway. So that was easy to put in place. So I have a lot of things that are easier for me than a lot of other people's. I listen to some of these people in the care course that are, I think my husband is stubborn and he doesn't hold a candle to what these other people do. So now my big challenge is I really don't think he should be left here by himself. I have cameras all over the house and I can monitor and I am limiting my myself to 30 minute trips because I can check the camera and I can call 911 if something happens, but he would not be receptive to having somebody come into the house. And I don't know how I'm going to get there. So this is the next thing I'm trying to figure out. Yes. There's always like something new. We kind of take care of one thing and then we're faced with something else. Oh yeah. Susan, I believe it is. And one of the support groups. And I've asked the question, how did you start having AIDS come in? At what point was your husband or your wife willing to accept somebody else coming into the house because I need to go places. I need to go to doctor's offices and things like that. And and they're not all convenient. And they said, well, they don't need it. You do. I said, I don't understand. And they say, you have somebody come in to help you because you can't do it all anymore. And that was a light bulb. These things have just been unbelievably helpful. Yes. And I want to point out one other thing that I hope Careblazers are still with me here watching this video. You just did another amazing trait that successful Careblazers do. And that is you ask really great questions. You're struggling with an issue. You see something that's on the horizon, needing more help in the home. You hear somebody else in the support group have help in the home instead of, oh my gosh, my husband will never take that. Oh my gosh, this is going to be too hard. I don't know how I'm going to, instead of going down that spiral, which you certainly could have done, but you still also said, wait, how did you get to that place? Like asking questions. That's huge. And then the two of us being retired and and Brian withdrawing even more from any kind of social interaction with anybody. He just, he was a workaholic. Always his interaction with people was through work. And when that stopped, it's like, okay, where do we go from here? How do I ask? Who do I ask for help? 
And so I teach knitting and crocheting and quilting. And so there's a group of women that I deal with. And when I was telling them, these are the things I'm facing, they said, Judy, I own a cleaning business. I'll come over and clean your house when you have an appointment or whatever. And he knows them. So it's not like, you know, some stranger coming in. That's That's a big one. That's a real big one. I think, especially when your person is very aware still. Absolutely. Well, I look forward to working with you and seeing how that unfolds moving forward with getting more help. Oh, it's going to be interesting. Not the interest I would have chosen, but. Right. Well, Judy, thank you so much for coming and spending your time sharing your experience with other Care Blazers. Is there anything you would want to say to anybody watching, like any last words or tips or anything at all that comes to mind? I have periods of personal darkness and hopelessness, and I find I need to walk away from it for a while. Mm -hmm. I could sit here 10 hours a day and watch these videos and go all over the internet and watch this and that and the other. And I come away so depressed. I don't want to drink a glass of water. So you have to be patient with yourself and know when you've hit a limit and just walk away, go get a good book, go get an ice cream cone, something. Totally. That's so good. You don't have to be focused on this all of the time. I wake up in the middle of the night with my notepad next to me making notes and I'm going, that is so not good. You know, you got what to kind of notes are you making in the middle of the night? Oh, well, I need to move the bush cutters away from the He'll stand on a stepladder on an uneven floor and do the, he cut the electric cord a couple of times. And I'm going, okay, check that one off the list. Right, right. Oh, I know what it was that I did the other day that I yelled at him. Oh, I really really lost it. He likes to vacuum. He does a better job than I do. I mean, floors, ceilings, cobwebs, and he broke a lamp. I mean, he was backing, backing, back me. And he, instead of taking the, the pieces to do different things, he took the whole upright vacuum cleaner and stands it on the couch doing this. And he oh. broke the lamp. And I said, well, that's a task you can't do anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, that was so bad. That was so not the right thing to do. Well, I'll do it different next time. He probably won't remember he broke the lamp. <laughs> Has he vacuumed since? Yes. So he's still vacuuming. Yeah. Nobody's perfect here. We all lose it from time to time. We're just human. We're not robots. Right. Just so. step back and say, okay, sir. All right. And stand in the mirror. Judy, what were you going to say next time? <laughs> you know? Yeah, you could totally do that. I right? do. You don't have to shake your finger at yourself, though. You could just say, well, you know, you could be nice. That's my mother. That's my mother. <laughs> no. You get to decide how you want to learn. You could beat yourself up through the process or you could decide to just, okay, what do I want to do differently next time? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All yeah. of the above. Well, thank you so much, Judy, for taking your time to chat with us. Thank you. And I think there's a rumor going around that you're going to start another thing or a spinoff of this with grief. Oh, yes. Groups. And I think that's phenomenal. Yes. Well, we've had several care course members who have lost their loved ones recently. And, you know, know. every Wednesday we have those support groups for spouses and for adult children and things like that. And I thought the people who have lost their spouses, many of them still want to stay in and they don't want to go and they still get pleasure and like help from the support group. But I think starting another one for grief for those who have lost a loved one or who are really grieving as they're losing their loved one, I think it would be helpful. Right. But the same token, we've had what, two or three in our group that that lost them like within the last couple of weeks and, uh, and having them come on and explain how they dealt with it, what they felt is also to me again looking down the road and you know this is coming eventually so the way that was handled for them is helpful to me yes I know. I love it. And that's why, I mean, people are still welcome to attend all of the groups or just one of the groups. It'll still be open to anybody, but I think having one specifically designed to focus on grief will be helpful. So yeah, yeah the rumor is true. Too. I was worried about what rumor you were going with there. <laughs> <laughs> no, so. that's, that's great. And yeah. I want to tell you that in my location here, I tried the Alzheimer support groups mm-hmm. uh, for the first year and they met 40 miles from the house. There were two of them, the way they, and of course with COVID, then we were on the phone, you know, it was a Zoom thing and so on. And so they had two phone numbers and we met as a group, a total group with the person giving the support and the person receiving it for the first 20 minutes or so. And then the people giving the support hung up and went to another phone number and they had a facilitator that was over there. It was a little awkward and so on. And there was a gentleman that led that group and most of them were men who were caring for their mothers or their wives. And they all sat there and talked about football for the last 20 minutes. And I said, I am getting absolutely nothing out of this group. You don't open up and talk about the difficult things when your your person is right there. And you're going to talk about football over here. Oh, 
not going to be me. So this has been a lifeline for yeah. me. Yeah. I'm glad to hear it. I know we have care blazers in the care course who also go to Alzheimer's support groups and, and they right. love them and it gets help. It's like with everything, you know, not everything's a good fit for everybody. And for some people, I mean, heck for some of those guys, it, that might've been like a good source of relief for them to just talk about something other than dementia, you know, getting Absolutely. back to your point. Early, and the, and the, and the uh, six couples that were there when I joined it had been together for four years. So they were going before COVID hit, they would meet for dinner and then go to the support group. And this was a big, you know, and I felt like the real odd guy out. Yeah, so yeah. maybe if I tried it again, there would be a different group. There would be different yeah. people or something. It's always, it's still... you know, I think support groups are incredibly helpful, but not every support group is going to be a good fit for everybody. So I'm Absolutely. glad that glad you're in ours. I'm glad that it's been helpful for you. I do think it's possible that an Alzheimer's support group could be helpful again in the future if you were looking for more. And yeah, we'll be starting a grief one here pretty shortly. So, well, you're amazing. Thank you very much mm -hmm. for all the work you do. I feel the same about you and all the other care blazers. So and thank you so much, Judy. energy that you have. Well, sometimes I get fired up when I'm live. I can control it on Instagram and YouTube. <laughs> but like when I was sometimes teaching a class and talking with you guys and you guys are getting, I'm like, ah. <laughs> you talk very fast too. Yeah, so sometimes. that's why I play them again, different time. Yes. And do you know, actually, this might be helpful for everybody. And maybe I should send an email to the care course members. There is a video speed controller, a free thing on the internet. When I watch videos, I usually watch them at one and a half times speed to go faster. So I can do it on any video, but you can also make it like 0 0.75, 0 0.5. So you can make I it. I do that on YouTube all the time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Especially if I, if it's a learning thing, like I'm learning a new technique of something, I put it down to 75% so I can follow exactly yeah. what they're doing. And, yeah. you know, the skills training thing. Um, yes. I don't see it on Zoom. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you could do it. It's always on the internet. So if anything's on the internet, so for example, any of the care course classes, any mm -hmm. of the support groups that are, you're watching as a replay, not live, but you're okay. watching as a replay, you can have that option. It's called video speed controller. If you just Google video speed controller, it's like an extension that's free. And so every time I watch a video up in the upper left-hand corner, it says like 1.0 and that means I'm watching it regular. And then I always click it to go to where I want it to go. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. That's a good thing to share with people because you do speak very fast. And I'm really happy that now we can go back and see the chat because just like Jenna and Tamara in the chat, they would pop up these links and everything that were so helpful and you go back to find them and, and they weren't there you know so I had my little screen scraper out and I was constant I have a whole notepad filled with care blazer links uh-huh I scrape it off and put it in there so I could go back and look at them yeah later. that was so, one of your guys's ideas in terms of yeah getting it was really like, really yeah. helpful download any of them and anytime you have a suggestions or any sort of comment or anything at all all you have to do is email us we could probably make it happen I mean that's how the grief support happened too. People started emailing and saying, I lost my loved one, but I still want to be a part of the group. It's like, you're still more than welcome to, and yeah. maybe we should start another one. So yeah. all right. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I appreciate your time, Judy. I'll see you around. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye. Also, Nico gets a belly 